Um, Dr. Rakesh Golvan, are you still here? Yeah, you are. Um, going to do a presentation. The uh, title of his original idea was Ammonia Plus Recovery. So I don't have any slides, actually. Oh, really? Oh. No. Oh. So I'm not going to use any slides because I gave, uh, I'm giving a presentation today, this afternoon, and I gave one yesterday. But what I wanted to do was put in perspective the nutrient issue. Um, if you look at the nutrient issue, there are many ways that we can solve this problem. And I classify them in three different methods. The first is nutrient separation. And nutrient separation is simply to take the nitrogen and phosphorus and incorporate that into a fertilizer, uh, which some of the papers you've seen here today, and essentially sell the fertilizer back to the farm. The problem with this separation is that you are unable to really change the ratio of the nitrogen and phosphorus in the final fertilizer. It is what you get. And depending on the source material, you're kind of dependent on that ratio. Oh, that's the kind of ratio you're hey, doing. Uh, Rakesh, yes. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, I'm taking home. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So sorry, the... You well. Thank you. Thank you. So the issue is that your ratio is not going to be much different than what the source material is. The other concern is that the pathogens in the source material, like in manure, for example, will end up to some extent in the final product. And the disinfection of the pathogens to kill all the pathogens in a solid material, like a biomass or a manure, is not that easy because they can survive, pathogens we know will survive uh, very high temperatures, uh, they will survive under very dire conditions, especially if they are immobilized on a matrix which is, uh, in, on which they can actually live for a very long time. So the survivability of the pathogens and their transmission to the product, the fertilizer in this case, is an issue because now the fertilizer is going to be handled by people and their pathogens could be surviving in this product because you have simply done what I call a separation of the nutrients. In the process, you have transferred some of the pathogens into the product as well. So this is the concern that needs to be addressed as to what is the fate of these pathogens and even the micronutrients. The other issue is the elements, the fine elements that, um, that we just talked about, the boron, the zinc, and so forth. There are many elements in manure that will get transmitted into the final product, in the fertilizer product. And the question is, is that going to be useful when the, when the thing is added to the soil on a repetitive basis? Will we end up in concentrating the soil with elements that we don't want in the end? Because those elements will end up in the food, and then there's a food chain cycle going on. And the question is, what is the long-term effect of those pathogens, of those microelements, that I trace amounts, but will end up being transferred in the final product. So this is the concern that I think needs to be addressed in the separation category. The second method of nutrient handling is to basically try to um, separate the nutrients and, and convert them into products that are, that are basically not directly transferred, but you, you separate them out in different forms. So one of the ways we talked about it talked about yesterday was making calcium phosphate from the phosphorus uh, that is coming into the water or that's coming in the manure and then selling the calcium phosphate as a product. Now, of course, in that case, we're not transferring the solid product, we're only transferring the chemical, in this case, the phosphate, in different forms, or taking the nitrogen and extracting the ammonia, which is what I talked about yesterday, and then using the ammonia to make ammonium sulfate and selling the ammonium sulfate as a chemical. So that, of course, is recovery. So the second category is recovery of the nutrients in a way that is not containing the other matrix that we have in the original product, in the original raw material. And recovery, the problem with recovery is that's only economical when the concentration of NNP is high. If you have a very low concentration of NNP, recovery doesn't make any economic sense. In other words, you have to have a certain amount of nitrogen. Uh, typically, if the nitrogen content is less than 100 ppm, and the phosphorus is less than 10 ppm, recovery ceases to make economic sense because you don't have enough material at the end to really sell and make any money. 
So the recovery is only possible when you have a concentrated material like a digestate or you have a municipal plant where you have an anaerobic digester and then the sludge is now concentrated in NMP that you can sort of live on and make money out of it if you want to sell the fertilizer eventually or sell the ammonia in this case. The third category is destruction. Can we destroy the nutrients? And this makes sense when the concentration is very small. So if you look at the first category, which is separation, the solid separation and all of those techniques, in the end, you're not gonna be able to recover, no matter what you do, you'll never be able to recover 100% of nutrients. You're gonna be left with 10%, 20%, 30%, 40% of NNP at the end. That has to be destroyed eventually. In other words, you're gonna have a component at the end which is so dilute that economic recovery does not make any sense, economic sense, and really incorporation is not possible because your rate of separation or incorporation is going to be very, very low. So if you look at any solid product, fertilizer, whatever you're trying to do, centrifuge it out and so on and so on, you'll recover 70%, 60%, you still have 30% of the phosphorus. So then the destruction comes in at the end, and the destruction, the problem is that the technology that has been used by uh, many, many companies and is still being used today is a lagoon. And, and a lot of people say, well, lagoons are no good, they're dinosaurs, they don't work, <coughs> but they are being used today. They are being used. And they are huge lagoons that are used by Tyson, by other companies, and it is a technology which is not bad. It does the job to some extent. It is not has been, it has not been updated. So what we need to do is update the lagoon technology because it is a low cost, high volume <coughs> system and if you have the land space, which we have, it is a technology that is successful, can be successful. So this afternoon I'm talking about how to make the lagoon basically a better technology than what it has been over the past maybe 3,000 years or something like that. Uh, because lagoons have been around for many, many years. So we need to upgrade the lagoon technology because I think that the processing of wastewater in a process like activated sludge or any other process you can come up with is not economical. It's not possible to treat millions of gallons of water and, and do it economically. Now we do that in municipal plants. We do treat millions of gallons of water um, in a municipal plant, but then people have to pay for it. For a company like Tyson or a company like a food product company that has a lagoon, nobody's gonna pay for it except the company has to pay for it. So there, the process of activated sludge at the end um, is gonna be expensive if you want to destroy the nutrients using that kind of a process. So I think the lagoon has a very important role to play because it is, it is natural. I mean, it is facultative. It does the job. It, is, it does it require areas, but it does work. And the reason why it has not, it's not working today is because our standards have changed. We want nutrient separation or nutrient destruction in a lagoon. As you know, lagoons are not really geared for nutrient destruction. Um, nutrients, uh, I mean, we have sludge accumulation in lagoons uh, now going on. I mean, if you look at any, any lagoon out there, it'll have four or five feet of sludge. And the, the uh, dredging of sludge is not, is not, is very expensive and you've got to dispose of that sludge, the dewater, and get rid of it somehow. So the, the lagoon problem is still there. The sludge problem is building up, you know, four or five feet of sludge. Uh, I've seen lagoons in which half of the lagoon is sludge, basically, and dredging is not cheap. I mean, millions of dollars can be spent on dredging. So, so we need to upgrade the lagoon technology, I believe, which is what I'm going to talk about this afternoon, and that was the destruction part. So I think if you look at the nutrient challenge, it has many, many different aspects uh, in terms of separation, in terms of recovery, <coughs> in terms of destruction that we need to address in this case. And I think that one of the papers I presented yesterday was regarding the recovery where we recovered the nitrogen as ammonia, uh, as an ammonia gas, we can convert to ammonium sulfate, and I talked about the phosphorus recovery as calcium phosphate as a precipitation from the, uh, in this case. We have applied the, that technology for municipal plants, uh, we can apply that to digest states where the NNP concentrations are high, so it makes sense to recover it. And you can sell the calcium phosphate, sell the ammonium sulfate, 
as a product and make money from it. And as I mentioned to you, that might be favorable for companies to do because the biogas selling in front of the low price of natural gas is not as great now because we have a lot of natural gas that is at low cost. So biogas doesn't really uh, fetch a lot of money now. So selling of nutrients might be another cash flow that could be generated that would be positive in this case. Um, in this case, so basically, it depends on the uh, the problem at hand and so forth. So, I want all of you to um, attend my afternoon pre presentation on the lagoon technology. I believe that that has to be something that we need to pay attention to uh, in trying to upgrade the technology itself. What time is your presentation? I think 2:55. Yeah. For more details. Yeah. So basically. Um, that uh, Rakesh, energy, yes. uh, this is very good what you are saying. We have a low technology and have technology, but I will tell you this, it's not sexy enough. If I come to a conference and tell the people I'm going to teach you how to use the old lagoon, you know what, I will be at the bottom. That's, it, okay. it works, and I, you know, from the point of view, right. it works, but is you know, you have Viking and well, the I'm EPA. <coughs> Look, by the way, we are going to reform the lagoons and we are doing this wonderful. Right. You know what is happening. <laughs> you never get well, opportunities. I think that, you know, being an academic, I, think I, I understand this problem. I, and I can publish papers in lagoons by, um, by making them act, you know, do more analysis of the data. Yes. I love the thought of modifying over here. Yes. And we have a system. It needs to do things better. Yes. But it's, it's already paid for in many cases, yes. which makes it a critical hurdle. Yes. If we can add to the value, if we can yes. capture value ahead or behind, reduce emissions, right. create flexibility right. to get the right. nutrient ratio right, right. <coughs> use what we have yes. will fit right. into the industry. Right. It may not be as se sexy at the uh, <laughs> presentations and conferences, but to the end user, it works. That's what we're looking for. Right. And, and I think that the, the, the advantage of upgrading a lagoon is to address the nutrient effect, how to take the nutrients out, the nitrogen, the phosphorus, which lagoons were not designed to do, how to address the sludge accumulation issue, which is happening in every lagoon out there. Uh, sludge depth is going up and up. And the third thing, of course, is that how do we uh, essentially create a final effluent that can meet tomorrow's standards? not just yesterday's, but tomorrow's. Uh, and the standards are going to get tighter and tighter. And finally, the question is that once we upgrade the lagoon, we can get a final effluent that is better quality, can we recycle it back? Can we use it back in the farm? Uh, because we can get a quality of water that makes it reusable. Not for drinking, not for portable, but for non-portable use, but at least make it reusable. Because one of the things that I basically want to mention is that the, the world is running out of water. You know, people don't realize the, the, all, the, um, all of the uh, <coughs> levels that you look at groundwater levels around the globe are declining. Fresh water is running out. And as fresh water runs out, uh, companies that are using millions of gallons of water uh, every day, I mean, it's not possible to make a, a chicken product without washing the chicken so many times. So companies that are using millions of gallons of water every day, it goes in the lagoon. If that water has to leave the premise uh, subject to NPDES permits, that's not a good thing. That's not going to be the future because that water is gone and that water has come out of the ground and the groundwater levels are declining and they will keep declining. And once the water gets to a low level, its quality becomes unusable then the company is, cannot exist. Yeah. You can't make a chicken product unless you wash it so many times. Uh, USDA will not allow it. So basically, the world is running out of water and we need water for eventually uh, for farming, for making product. So the recycle of the water, <coughs> increasing the effluent quality and recycling the water is going to be tomorrow's challenge. And unless we can upgrade the lagoon, where millions of gallons of water is coming in and get an effluent that is high quality that we can potentially recycle, I think that is where we are headed to because we are running out of water. Yes. Yes. I do have a question. Yes. So I know that we can destroy ammonia in a nitrogen gas or any other form. 
how do you destroy phosphorus? Because phosphorus is element cannot be yes. destroyed right. unless you use nukes. So right. <laughs> yeah, so that's a good question. Yeah. Um, when you have low levels of nitrogen, we can denitrify and we can uh, nitrify to nitrates and then nitrates can denitrify to nitrogen gas. So we can do that, yes. The question is what happens to phosphorus? The only future of phosphorus because the world is running out of phosphorus too, I mean by 2030 or 2050, depending on whom you talk to, but the, but the phosphorus, the future of phosphorus is that we can precipitate it out. And, and, and once we can precipitate it out, uh, and we can do that biologically too. Yeah. So once we can precipitate the, the low levels of phosphorus biologically, which we know how to do, then that phosphorus can be recycled back uh, as fertilizer. And that is the eventual fate of phosphorus in this case. We want to be able to recycle the phosphorus because we are running out of phosphorus too. So it still be in a solid form? It, it would be in the sludge form, but it won't be the six feet of sludge at the bottom of the lagoon, which is what we have today. It'll be the one or two feet of sludge that when we have to dredge every so many years, maybe every 10, 15, 20 years, not every three years or five years, oh uh, costing God. millions of dollars. Uh, if we can dredge it once in 10 years, uh, then it makes sense because what we're going to recover is not a huge amount of sludge that we have to dewater and waste, but really the phosphorus that we can actually then reuse as fertilizer. So the dredging cost can be recovered as fertilizer uh, in this case, and that's the eventual fate of phosphorus. And we know how to do that, it's just that we haven't done it. Uh, we have to look at how to upgrade the lagoon so we can actually make it uh, uh, favorable in terms of water quality, in terms of producing phosphorus, in terms of destroying the nitrogen when the concentration is low. Thank you. Um, okay. So I'm gonna, uh, we're okay. gonna pause here and move to the next okay. presentation, but if, I, if you have any questions, please follow. <laughs>